In this episode, I'm once again joined by Henry Shukman, award-winning poet, Zen teacher, and author of One Blade of Grass, a Zen memoir. In this interview, Henry reveals what he calls Zen's true miracle and shares his own personal journey of healing childhood trauma in the context of spiritual awakening and integration of enlightenment. Henry also explores the two purposes of Zen koan training, contrasts different models of enlightenment, and explains how to awaken in the midst of intense suffering and pain. So without further ado, Henry Shukman. Henry Shukman, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for having me back. A uh, real pleasure. So in our last episode, we took a journey through your early life and your contact, uh, establishing contact with Zen and indeed some of the awakening experiences that followed from that. And I'd recommend that episode to anybody as along with uh, Henry's book, One Blade of Grass, a uh, Zen memoir, a really fabulous book. We left off teasing, if you want, the topic of trauma. And you yourself, uh, as is detailed in the book, One Blade of Grass, have extensively explored different trauma modalities, uh, dream work, uh, somatic uh, trauma modalities, and so on. And uh, that is uh, woven into the narrative of One Blade of Grass. And just to jump into one quote from that, you write, deep down, I still saw women as providers of comfort, pleasure, security through their unknowable bodies and clear-sighted hearts. But any moment they might turn round and dump you. And men were still deniers of worth, thieves of self-respect, purveyors of shame. They put you down, then tried to recruit you for their power trips. One morning I was sitting on the kitchen floor in our house in Santa Fe, hunched over a puddle of clear liquid about nine inches in diameter. The liquid was tears. For the first time in years I was weeping without restraint. A reservoir of old grief had been tapped, touched, opened, the cork blown. The well of grief rose, and the tears streamed from nose and cheek uncontrollably. And you go on from that point to detail your work with Mark Bregman. I'm curious if you could lay out some of the key traumas that you were facing, and what you began to do to resolve them. And I'm um, also wondering if you can talk about the dream work what role it played in your healing journey and perhaps also to add to the mix why mention trauma in a in a memoir about zen <laughs> right right okay well, well that's great thank you thank you very much for quoting that and um yeah it's it's great because i you know you you take me right into the heart of it so uh through the quote from the book so we can go right in there um and you read very well, by the way, Steve, it's, it's, it's a joy hearing you Thank you. Uh, quote. You make it sound much better than I thought it would sound kind of thing. So that's lovely. Um, basically, okay, where's, where's the best uh, point in? I mean, huh, yeah. I mean, I think there's an interesting relationship to be explored between any spiritual quest or search and trauma, you know, um, what do they have to do with each other? I don't think, I mean, I don't think that in all cases, everybody's traumatized, actually. I, some people say that these days, I just don't know. Um, but I think it's probably more common, and the, maybe the nuance of the word trauma has changed in recent years or decades. You know, in the old days, it meant something unusually grievous uh, had happened to a person, and that might be, um, you know, some calamitous external event in, in the wider world. Um, uh, or it could mean something, you know, narrower and more domestic, but it had to be something really pretty uh, unusually um, difficult. These days, um, some of the trauma specialists seem to be defining it rather differently um, I mean, Gabor Mate, for example, who's a, you know, a very popular sort of speaker on the subject these days and great, great to listen to and watch if you haven't. Um, he, he'll say, you know, really, as a child, to have difficult feelings and be alone with them, that's trauma, something like that. So, you know, that might include rather a large portion of the population, I don't know. In my own case, I know that, you know, at the age of six months, um, 
I was doing fine as a baby, apparently. And my mother and my father, who were academics, and at that time they had a fellowship, my dad did and my mum went along in Finland, in Helsinki. They also did sort of, I talk about this a little bit in the book, but they actually were both, it sounds maybe a little bit of sort of glamorizing to say this, but they really were actually kind of low level spies because they were both in Russian studies and many people, many academics in Russian studies were, were involved to some extent in a little bit of espionage because they knew Russian and could speak it fluently in, in, in the case of my two parents anyway. And while they were in Helsinki, they were actually kind of, uh, what's the word, sort of sent on some kind of, some kind of mission to Leningrad, which is, was not very far away across the, uh, whatever the sea is there, the Gulf of Finland or something. And they were gone for some number of days, you know, maybe up to 10 days or something. I, I've heard different versions of this, but and when they came back, having left me, their little baby with uh, some sort of, uh, you know, a pair girl or nanny, they came back and I was covered in eczema, really severe eczema. And um, that eczema stayed with me really till my, uh, really vanished, it was really gone, touch wood, since my early to mid thirties, but getting better and better through my twenties, but through much of my youth, childhood and youth, I had it quite severely. But in those 10 days, you know, uh, that they were gone and I was on my own with a stranger and suddenly weaned as well. And then really having this uh, raging skin. What did I go through as an infant? You know, I, 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 I don't know fully, of course not, but I've done some uh, kinds of uh, somatic trauma work that seem to really go back to some pre-verbal, um, intense pre-verbal, uh, uh, difficult emotion, you know, powerful rage and terror and, um, you know, anguish, you know, and I, I don't really, I don't really know for sure, but I, 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 I sense that, um, you know, part through on and off through my adult life, um, there were, you know, reservoirs of, of distress, you know, sort of in my system, you know, and that, um, that different kinds of therapy had different attitudes about, you know, for example, early on, I was, I was really lucky to get into some cognitive behavior therapy, you know, in quite a, quite a, quite a, you know, I got very serious about it and it was profoundly helpful to realize that I had, um, I had a bit habituated myself to extremely sort of negative thinking patterns that I could switch on. They could turn on, on a dime. They could turn on a dime from sort of ordinary day to, you know, the, the, I missed the bus. I got to wait 15 minutes for the next bus, you know, and could quickly get into a, a, a you know, kind of crazily negative thought loop and feel pretty lousy. And so cognitive therapy for me was extremely helpful to, to um, expose my, um, my thought habits that were a kind of crude rudimentary philosophy, so to speak, of life, which included quite a lot of self downing of what they call awfulizing, you know, turning a, a molehill into a mountain and, uh, you know, catastrophizing. And also this, this term that was coined by Albert Ellis, masturbating, meaning saying must, must, must about making, you know, unrealistic demands on self and world. I was doing a lot of those things and um, making myself miserable. And to realize that and start to see the connection between habits of hot cognitions, they sometimes call them like hot thoughts, between them and ways of feeling, that there actually is a direct connection, you know, that we construe events in a certain way and bam, we, we feel about it a certain way. Um, that, you know, to, to get more adept at noticing that and at changing the habits of thought, 
was incredibly helpful and really uh, took me out of uh, several years of, of I guess, uh, you know, intermittent uh, depression that I'd had uh, in my early 20s and uh, allowed me to sort of, you know, kind of uh, start living more openly and fully. And that was that was great. However, you know, over the years subsequent, I, I would sometimes feel that, you know, there just were unresolved, uh, uh, difficult feelings that didn't necessarily seem to be entirely um, to do with current events, so to speak. And so I, at a certain point, yeah, I got into this kind of deep, Jung, Jungian-ish dream work. Um, I think it was uh, sort of a offshoot in a certain way of the work of James Hillman, you know, perhaps to some extent Robert Bly coming out of that kind of, kind of realm, Thomas More. Um, <clears throat> and um, it, it did sort of, um, I think, I guess it would fall under the realm of what's sometimes called soul work these days or soul building or soul making work. Um, and there is, I think it's fair to say there's some kind of view in that realm that there's a primordial wound in all of us. There's some kind of primordial grief and our, our private sorrows are connected to that or connect us to it. So by going into, by opening up to our, you know, private unfelt griefs, we can open up to a sort of wider wound. Stephen Jenkinson, some of you may know, um, he's a, um, he has done a lot of work with dying, basically. He talks about the old hurt, meaning something like this, this sort of, a, you know, prime, primeval, primordial grief that's in us, you know, all of us. And, and, and how helpful it can be to open up to that. And I mean, leaving that aside, that larger kind of grief, whatever it may be, um, even for me personally, just to be, uh, to allow myself to be led, as I think the dreams did lead me, to opening up to uh, sorrows, grief, wound, whatever, that I hadn't, or trauma, that I had not really allowed myself to process ever, then meaning really essentially to feel fully, to be encouraged to do that in the kind of safe space, so to speak, that um, you know the dream worker Mark Bregman helped to generate and the context and frame that he created for this kind of healing work. It was, it was very, very helpful. It, it, um, it actually in some ways was a turning point um, in, my, uh, in my openness to trusting. Uh, you know, I think we talked about this last time, a sort of mistrust of men, especially men in authority. Um, that surely harked back or had been uh, one of its engines, I guess, had been, you know, difficult relationship with my dad as a, as a child, as a boy who left really when I was seven. And um, so, but I hadn't really, I hadn't really uh, allowed myself as a kid to feel the, the grief of that. And it, it's, it perhaps was seemed too great. And I kind of shut down in some ways. So years later, feeling that, letting the tears run for that was very healing. It's a kind of release. And, you know, a lot of, I suspect a lot of sort of psychic energy, so to speak, gets, uh, can get uh, occupied by uh, uh, sort of tamping down our feelings if we're doing that. And to relinquish that, uh, that attempt and to let feelings that are difficult, you know, to let them flow freely. I mean, th this doesn't mean acting them out and, you know, misbehaving or anything. No, 
but especially I think with grief to, to let our grief um, uh, in a certain sense sort of overwhelm us can actually be a really healthy thing. And I don't know quite the mechanics of it, but for sure that was the turning point when I started to do that. And um, I, I think that was connected with some kind of trauma release. So that's a very long answer, but maybe I haven't quite, maybe I have to make it a tiny bit longer because there was a connection between that, doing that, opening up in that kind of way. And um, yeah, being able to actually go, so to speak, further in my Zen training, actually, I felt as I opened up in that, area to whatever extent I was able to my Zen training kind of went deeper so um, yeah there's there's and you know maybe I, mean, I was just speculating earlier on like what's the connection between a spiritual quest and trauma and it might be that um, you know if we're traumatized folks we're we're looking more earnestly for some kind of relief, some kind of more universal relief um, from difficult feelings. And I suppose there's a, there could be a danger or a hazard of, uh, you know, turning to bliss states as a way of avoiding difficult feeling but I don't think that's what you see I don't think true awakening or real awakening or whatever we might call it is about bliss states it's about being more freely open to examine ordinary consciousness that's how I take it anyway okay is it how's that Steve for a, for a start on the subject very interesting you're talking there about the relationship between the spiritual quest and trauma and I'm wondering, is it possible to be enlightened and traumatized? Does enlightened imply some kind of resolution of trauma? I suppose we, in that sense, need to define enlightenment. What are its limits? Uh, and perhaps a related question, do you think Zen would have been enough with its methods of uh, koan training and sitting practice and all the other aspects of Zen? Uh, why do you think these modalities were useful in deepening your Zen training? Did you find Zen deficient uh, in, in those methods, or is it just not the purview of Zen? I think this, these questions are all still circling around the idea of the relationship between the spiritual quest and trauma. Um, but in, in specific, I'm curious if you think, is it possible to be enlightened and traumatized? <laughs> That's a great question. I, I don't think I'm qualified to answer it. Um, who was it? Somebody said, uh, I, I don't know if there's such a thing as enlightenment, but I know that there are, or enlightened beings, but there are certainly enlightened moments. Somebody said that. I think there's, there's, a, there's a Zen master actually who said, he was asked what's enlightenment. And he thought for a moment and then he said, he said something like, I, I guess that enlightenment is when the difference between the enlightened state and the unenlightened state has disappeared. So I thought that was, that's quite an interesting response. Mm -hmm. You know, in Zen, there's this notion that we might have um, some initial enlightenment experience that is initial in the sense that it's, you know, it's very strong and incredible and marvelous, whatever but it gradually fades. And then with ongoing training in our, in the school that I'm involved in, that would be with koans, ongoing training. We can then begin with koans once we've had some opening like that. And then at a certain point, there might be a deeper kind of experience, which although it's not that it stays with the, the, the wild, vivid, uh, vividness of, of an actual awakening experience, after it, some somewhere or other it doesn't fade it doesn't go away something's knocked out that doesn't come back and 
in a way, that's the hope that koans will lead to that. And now, but is that, is that full enlightenment? I, I just don't know. But I know that something like that can truly happen. And that um, thereafter, um, are we then, is there no trauma left? I, I just, I don't know. Maybe for some. I mean, I think it would probably depend on how traumatized somebody is in the first place, you know, and um, whether, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very, I, I suspect probably in some kind of full enlightenment, that would have to be the case, I guess, whatever that might mean. But you see, Zen has this idea that having reached a certain point where I, I guess basically everything's fallen away, uh, and there's a what Zen phrase, body and mind fall away, when that's happened, self and world are completely fallen away. After that, yeah, there's, there's some sort of reconstitution, but, but it's much freer, much, much freer. And we don't ever lose sight of the, uh, the utter freedom you know, of every moment. But the Zen idea is that we then have to forget about that, that as long as we're in any way holding on to some awareness or consciousness of having had enlightenment or something like that. That's not, we're not there yet. It needs to be washed away, they say. And then we need to even forget having washed it away. So some kind of return to, you know, utter ordinariness is part of the program in Zen. And that's what would be sometimes you know called integration or sometimes they call it personalization and i i don't know really there's there's different ways to look at this and i'm speaking as somebody who's insufficiently experienced but on one level you know when when we've had a, a more thorough awakening experience of really see that everything has somehow been a sort of apparition and a construction and and that it's possible to see through everything in some way. You know, after that, everything's um, everything's kind of uh, welcome. And I, I would think that would include trauma, that nothing would be excluded. It's a universally welcoming uh, fact. I mean, I think our relationship with trauma would be different, that we would be less, um, you know, less, certainly less resistant to it and less uh, sort of uh, afraid of it, actually. And less, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I could, I, 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 yeah, I'm sorry, I'm rambling a bit, but also, I mean, I would, I would regard um, whatever enlightenment may be, surely it's, it's about a heart broken open and a, and a, and a heart like that is um, is not closed to grief. It's not closed to closed to suffering. It's not closed to the suffering of others. It goes very quickly, I suspect, to compassion. But it may well feel grief at the state of the world, grief at the state of other beings and their suffering, and the grief would quickly. Sometimes it would feel indignation as well. But all these states would quickly convert to um, compassionate um, motivation to help and, and serve the best one can. So I don't know. I, I somehow, I, mean, I suppose it would depend on our definition of trauma, but I'm... I, I don't know that some kind of enlightenment that would exclude anything, including human human emotion, could be quite could be quite right. I just think it would be um, it would have a different attitude to to intense emotion, but heartbreak's part of it, I'm sure, and. Um, yeah, I think even even anger. I mean, there are Tibetan 
sort of deities who seem to personify anger, they're somehow welcome. Nothing isn't welcome. And, uh, you know, anger, I mean, we may, we may realize, for example, that ill will that can often come mixed in with anger, that's not necessary, that's not helpful, that's unwholesome. But anger free of ill will is a very clear, strong energy. And I don't, I don't expect that that would be unwanted, banished from the state of enlightenment. Especially if we're coming back to that, whoever that Zen master was, that enlightenment is when non-enlightenment and enlightenment are the same. What a, what a great statement. I love that, actually. It seems to me something to really aspire to. Yeah, because, you know, it's, I mean, just sorry, I, one other little point. If you look at the Heart Sutra, it says, you know, form is exactly emptiness, meaning to awaken is to see that all phenomena of whatever nature, whatever kind, they're fundamentally, they're empty, you know, and people interpret that word in different ways. But in Zen, really, it's like, there are different levels of what we mean by emptiness, but fundamentally gone, as the Heart Sutra says, gone, gone, utterly gone. But the next statement is that emptiness is exactly form. In other words, all phenomena are, uh, are the expression, this emptiness expressing itself. And so all are, are kind of, you know, welcome. They're, they're, a, they're a gift, really. So we don't have to exclude anything. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm repeating myself. I'll stop there. Very interesting indeed. I'm looking up that Zen master. Ah. I can't find his name right now. <laughs> I think it's um, actually Shinzen Young's teacher. Oh, Joshu Sasaki? Yeah. No, an another one. Shinzen tells the story of being on Japanese television. Uh, and uh, he, he was there as an English speaking, uh, Japanese speaking American with the, um, I guess, head monk and then the abbot. A TV host looked to him and said, looked at Shinzen and said, so what is this enlightenment uh, really? And Shinzen looked to the head monk and then the head monk looked at the abbot, the, you know, the Zen master. And he said, well, I guess you could say that enlightenment is the passing away of the distinction between enlightened and not enlightened. <laughs> that's a beautiful story. I didn't know that. Thank you. I don't know if that's the same Zen master, or maybe uh, maybe there's a kind of a meme going around the Roshi uh, <laughs> Roshi net. <laughs> Could be, but you know, it it may well be because I heard it from one of my teachers, and she I think was reporting on having seen something on TV. So it could well be it could well be that that same instant. Mm. That's very interesting. Yeah, you know that's consistent with the Zen uh, aspiration, as I understand it, in our lineage. It's it's expressed quite like that. Mm. Let's get let's get clear, but then let's not hang around there in boundless clarity. We don't need to, because you know all this is the boundless clarity. You know, our chatting right now is boundless clarity showing itself this way. So there's no need to sort of get attached to boundless clarity because it's, it, it's all this anyway. And there, there, are, there are a lot of koans actually that point to this kind of reintegration of awakening as not being something separate and distinct from this very moment just as it is. And from that perspective, why wouldn't that include trauma if somebody is carrying trauma? I suppose it might encourage them to, to, to work with it and process it or something. They might, they might feel freer about doing that. Yeah. In the case of trauma, um, you mentioned that the word has been nuanced. Uh, the definition has changed and expanded considerably in recent years. I think that's fair to say. And in a sense, uh, if one um, is involved in some sort of car accident and has a limp, presumably uh, different as one be becomes more and more awakened or enlightened or progresses perhaps through through the Zen path, for example, uh, 
one wouldn't necessarily, I think, expect the limp to the physical injury to somehow through the process of practice of meditation or koan to heal uh, additionally, so that the one wouldn't walk with a limp. And so if trauma is, in a certain sense, a psycho-emotional injury that might cause a kind of a limp in perception or skewing of perception or reaction, mm -hmm. then I wonder if, if the analogy holds there. But as you say, today, trauma seems to be almost a synonym for any kind of conditioning at all, any kind of <laughs> samskara or any kind of impression on the mind stream or impression on the, you know, the being in some sort of sense, in which case, uh, how much conditioning can one be free from? Respiration is a sort of conditioning, a sort of habit, yes. even enlightened people yes. breathe. Yes. So I wonder if yes. uh, the relationship to trauma, you seem to be positing that maybe it's possible they become very, very deeply enlightened, still have unresolved trauma, and that the relationship to the trauma would change. I wonder, would the, would the trauma yeah. still retain its capacity to, as it does, um, as it typically does, hijack perception? or the sorts of reactions uh, that occur when, when someone is traumatized. Um, yeah. I wonder, uh, yeah. would trauma still have its power to do that? If so, yeah. what yeah. is the point of awakening in the face of something like that? Yeah, that's a very good point. I would, yeah, I think it's, that's, 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 that's uh, you know, this word resolved trauma. I mean, I would guess that, um, that would, I mean, maybe we just have to accept that there are different degrees of enlightenment or different, different uh, thoroughnesses of enlightenment. So, yeah, somebody might be largely enlightened, you know, and most of the time they, they, they are resting in an awareness that does not get occluded. And then there may still be something that switches on some old reactivity and boom, they're lost to that awareness. I mean, there's stories that even Ramana Maharshi would would lose his temper and even be uh, rather sort of, uh, I mean, there's even, I've heard stories that, you know, he would beat people with a stick in a rage in the kitchen if they hadn't scrubbed something properly or something like that. You know, and he, he's a model of enlightenment for the recent, you know, last century or so, you know, he, we, they don't come more enlightened kind of thing than that, as far as we know. And yet even he could, could lose it briefly now and then, uh, if these stories are accurate. Um, so could we accept that, you know, well, someone's very largely enlightened and still susceptible now and then to some old reactivity that hijacks the system? And if they are, does that mean we throw out their enlightenment entirely? No, I don't think so. I don't see why the relationship, it, why it shouldn't be, a, you know, an asymptote that there's the ideal, you know, this term, uh, maybe, maybe not all listeners know it, but so sort of, uh, I speak as an ignoramus, but it's a mathematical term of a graph, a kind of curve that gets ever, ever closer to an axis. So if you imagine a, you know, a straight line axis, that's sort of the ideal. And the graph gets closer and closer and closer and closer to it, getting almost parallel to it, but never quite becoming it. So that would be the human and the enlightened, you know, the human, the, the, the relative and the absolute or something that the, the, the perfection of enlightenment, it exists, is real. And we're always as practitioners working to get closer and closer to it, but we may never actually touch it. Now that's, that's one view. And of course, so, so that, that would be, you know, there's always going to be some residue that isn't yet fully cleaned up. Let's say, looking at it that way. Fine. I mean, no problem. There's another view, of course, at the same time, which is that what awakened nature actually looks like is this world just as it is. So there's a level on which, you know, a person a society, a world can be full of error and, you know, unwholesome action and behavior and, and thinking and feeling and so on. And that's exactly awakened nature, you know, so there's a, there's that view as well, that, you know, 
just as things are in all their multifarious imperfections is actually perfect. And, you know, we can come to see that. And the, you know, the, some, you know, skeptics might say, well, well, again, then what's the use of that? How are you helping to make a happier world, a kinder world? But actually seeing, really being filled with a sense of the, the, the intrinsic beauty, peace, wonder of this moment, just as it is with the world on fire, just as it is, is, is a, is an, is a incomparable wonder. That very sense can also be a motivating force to work, to bring our, mm, our, our delusions under control and our poisons under control so that we are working toward a kind of happier world at the same time. You see what I mean? I mean, it sounds a little bit um, contradictory or something, but actually it isn't that um, the recognition of the peace, beauty, wonder, utter sort of blessedness that is actually present in this and every moment, that can be a motivating force for working for change. So it, it's not, uh, it doesn't create apathy, it creates compassion and hopefully effective, compassionate action arising from that. Like, I, I, have I... Have I taken us slightly off track? Look, there's one other really important point that 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 you you just touched on, and um, I wanted to bring up and and explore a bit more, which is that another thing about trauma is that sometimes, in the depths of an extremely traumatic incident, people awaken. There are cases of uh, I, I have a couple of friends who colleagues actually, one in particular who had a very severe motorbike accident. And in the midst of it, or in the immediate aftermath of it on his way to the hospital, I can't exactly remember the details. He had a sort of infinite boundless awakening. And, and it was for real. I mean, he was, you know, in hospital for however, how long, and thereafter, um, he was actually already in Zen training, but thereafter, you know, he's, he, he's, he's been ever freer and more clearly awakened. And he's a sort of senior teacher in our lineage, actually, and has been teaching for 30 years or something. And so it's, it's, uh, it can really happen. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of anything like that yourself, Steve, if, you know. Of course, I think, uh, yes, there are many stories like that kind of, uh, crisis induced spiritual experiences you know yeah. that sort of thing uh road to damascus kind of style spiritual convert conversions of or, or epiphanies um yes. uh, uh, pr prompted by pressure from some sort of illness or terrible situation or shock or so on and so forth you know or even getting hit on the head uh, by the roshi <laughs> hey steve we just had a freeze there oh yeah did you I, I heard as far as spiritual Damascus moments prompted by, and then it froze at my end. Yeah. Did it freeze at your end or not? Um, probably. I'm not sure who, who's to blame, uh, but yeah. I, it wasn't a very interesting point I was making. So perhaps we'll just move on. Um, well, I thought it was now, but wait a minute. What about, would you speak a little bit to your own story or would you be, uh, or have you done that elsewhere on the podcast or? Well, um, whatever. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, cert I certainly, as we've discussed mm -hmm. offline, have had, uh, if you want, transpersonal experience in the face of uh, health uh, catastrophe. <laughs> health catastrophe. Well, it's, in a sense, it's near death experience that resulted in some, uh, a transpersonal experience with some consequences. I wouldn't yes. go so far as to call that any kind of spiritual awakening or any kind of uh, on any kind of scale established by any sort of tradition. Uh, I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't claim that. But uh, I think the, the principle certainly is, is true. And 
there are many examples, aren't there, of that? People having some kind of uh, profound spiritual or transpersonal or meaningful transformative experience prompted yes, yes. by the pressure of illness, proximity to death, uh, mm -hmm. or, or, or sometimes just nothing at all. The stiff breeze seems to do it for some people. <laughs> some people yes, are just yes. sort of ready, you know, about to topple any moment. So, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I think it's very interesting. Perhaps another place where uh, this uh, question comes into play is the uh, integration of awakening. Mm. You've mentioned that koan practice can't really be engaged with the, the full koan training can't really be engaged with unless one has had the, the glimpse, unless one has had the taste of awakening that you mentioned before. And then actually part of koan practice is some kind of, I don't know if you'd use the word integration or some mm -hmm. sort of uh, uh, you know, seasoning or something of the awakening. Um, curious how that relates to this apparent paradox between a kind of always perfect awakening and an awakening that uh, is integrated is the purpose of the of the koan training to prepare you to teach is it to uh, help you express uh, the awakening in uh, different mm -hmm. ways or what mm -hmm. what's the purpose of the koan training related to this particular discussion or paradox mm. yeah very thank you um let me see how I can speak to that. I mean, first of all, um, no, it's not to prepare us to teach, not at all. Teaching is an entirely other matter. Um, well, it overlaps, but it's a different matter. Um, the, I'd say there are at least two main things we could sort of identify about. The purpose of Cohen training. I, I, by the way, I don't, I think it's great to sit with koans uh, regardless of where you're at in your practice. But the training with a teacher, um, that track, uh, when that, when that, when we're, if we're beginning on that and working through these several books of classical koans that exist, uh, we have to have had a clear, what we call Kensho, you know, seeing original nature. Is what that means, Kensho experience. We have to have had that, or we simply don't know what these koans are about. We'll, we'll, we'll use our minds to try to figure them out, and, and uh, that's not what they're for at all. They're, they're, they're opaque to you know, the thinking mind, the, the rational, ordinary mind, but they're not opaque once we've had uh, a glimpse of this other dimension you know, so-called awakened nature or original nature, which is infinite and one and empty. You know, and typically in a first experience, one of those three dimensions will be more apparent than another. And, you know, the, 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 those three dimensions apply to self and they apply to world as well. They say it's easier to see that the self is empty, in other words, has never been there the way we thought it had been there than it is to see that the world is empty. They say that, and um, you can, but you know, we hope that, so, so let me just uh, try to stay clear. So when somebody embarks on training with koans with a teacher, they need to have had one, some glimpse like that and powerful, you know, it's got to be real sort of shock to the system usually and very, very beautiful. And it feels like whenever we have one of these openings, it, it feels like in some sense, we, we've, we've sort of, you know, it seems like a total ultimate experience every time. Like this is, I've seen the truth or something. It always sort of feels like that. Um, now, as we embark on Cohen training, we are encouraged to, that, that experience is helped to live in us more through the koan training. Um, in time, we may well have further experiences through the koan training as well that reveal more and more and more of this awakened nature. But we should bear in mind really that anytime there's an opening of whatever degree of magnitude or thoroughness, really what's going on is not that we're sort of getting to see something, we're we're releasing, you know, there's some 
uh, portion of our ordinary construction of reality that we release. And it's, it, because it's let go of, we get this hit of, of sort of uh, what it is that's there when we're not constructing reality in the way we usually do. And again, it's either empty or all one or infinite that we see. And sometimes we see all three, you know, and, but it's not really, it's not really a, a, any kind of a, you know, a, a, a attainment. It's not sort of that we're getting to see something. It's just that we're releasing our ordinary way of seeing to some degree in some portion of our constructed reality and therefore suddenly open to you know what is prior to the construal of reality that we ordinarily make um and so in the course of current training we'd hope for more of those openings and maybe maybe we hope that at some point you know after a koan a full koan training or near the end of it or something there might be a more thorough release that really uh sort of sort of goes goes deeper through us and and uh, and 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 uh, there's there's even less sort of thing than we than we had thought. They're really, really we're we're freed in in a really re, really beautiful, remarkable way. And th- we were, uh, I guess, just I was talking about that a little bit earlier in this in this uh, discussion. But that's um, one. So one of the let's say benefits of koan training is that is releasing more through it mm-hmm. and um getting even clearer than an initial experience allows us to be another aspect of it and it's closely related and it's almost just conceptual to divide them but another aspect of it is that every koan is um sort of a it's it's showing how that you know boundless emptiness or whatever is always manifesting it's always appearing as the contents of this moment and in a koan we we have a little instance of that in any koan i mean for example there's one there's one famous master who whatever he was asked about awakening about practice about zen all he would do was hold up a finger that that was his teaching so we kind of sit with that well what on, what on earth is this what what is this finger? <laughs> What's it? Sh- it's not it's not the middle finger, by the way. It's just a finger. What is he showing? What's he? Why could that be a teaching? How could one finger be, a, you know, a complete sort of teaching that could, you know, heal all our wounds and 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 uh, awaken us to reality? Well, that's what we sit with if we're working with that koan. And, and we may suddenly get a glimpse that, wow, it may not be about a finger, just some other thing. We suddenly, suddenly get this hit. The pen or the, the leaf on the path or, you know, a cloud in the sky or, a, you know, a, a cup by the sink, you know, just one thing suddenly acquires this sort of, a, you know, vast all-encompassing uh, sense, just one phenomenon. And, and that would be a glimpse of another aspect of this awakened nature in action, in, in, in the way it appears. And so we kind of take it that this master, Judy or Gute, he was, he was showing something more about any ordinary phenomenon than we might ordinarily see. So again, it's not, Zen isn't interested, and this might seem a little paradoxical or contradictory even, it's not so interested in extraordinary states of mind. It's more interested in seeing ways of perceiving ordinary reality and opening us up to, you know, different dimensions that we can, well, we can open to in this very moment and in any one phenomenon in this very moment. 
So um, that is speaking to integration, that the if integration means there's on the one hand my ordinary troubled reactive deluded way of being and then on the other hand there's this boundless uh beauty or whatever you know boundless other state that we're labeling awakened or even you know beginnings of enlightened or whatever terminology we use the integration would precisely be working toward those two states not being two states and our view in zen what we come to actually see is that truly they never were two anyway that and that's the real liberation is when we realize that um our uh, the the you know the 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 apparent duality of awakening and deludedness delusion whatever it's a harsh word i don't like it really but misunderstanding or something on the one hand awakening on the other hand the apparent duality there has been wrong that just our ordinary self and our ordinary life this ordinary moment is 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 sort of the ultimate that's that's the real liberation when we when, when there's no longer you know something to be sought we we found it right here so that's that's what koan training perhaps you know is is for as as henry understands it you know mm. and others may see it more deeply than i do you know well for sure will do you write uh, in one blade of grass about a particular moment of realizing this theme that you're discussing now you write here an intense energy was moving all through me and through the world, and I could feel tears streaming down my face, tears of love, of joy, of gratitude. It was true, as the Buddhist said. I was one with the world. I was one with everything. The whole world was my body, my mind. And because of that, I was beloved. I belonged. I was healed in all possible ways. All had been well, secretly well, all along. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say perhaps that, you know, the, the long process of koan training is to make that more consistent mm. and more ordinary. Even there, it's a little uh, out of the ordinary, you know. I mean, we don't need to have tears streaming down our face all the time, you know. <laughs> you know, that was... Uh, that was a, a happy moment and it can be that way but it can also just be really ordinary i mean i think actually you know steve i may bring this up last time we had a little discussion that i can't now remember if it was in the interview or just after it when we were talking about art and you know poetry in my own case and music in your case and we were talking about how both of us i think i hope i'm not exposing anything I shouldn't, but seemed sounded like both of us had had, um, you know, very committed lives in the arts that at a certain point shifted. And we felt that, uh, please correct me if I'm expressing this wrong, but we both felt somehow that the need to express ourselves or express something through art was uh was gone or liberated or released or something by some event in life whatever that may have been and thereafter i think i remember i was saying something like you know why the old need to express something through poetry in my case or writing you know um was gone after a certain point in my zen training because everything every moment was such a perfect infinite whatever ultimate expression that how could any other expression be needed kind of thing and that is another way of coming at this uh ordinariness in zen that you know the 
the miracle uh, there's a, it's a famous zen line actually some old master met a miracle worker who could walk on water and see the future and teleport himself or whatever and and he was unimpressed and said you know that that that's that's no good for me my miracle is yeah, is chopping wood and drawing water those are my miracles and I, I, how beautiful you know mm. making a cup of tea that's really the miracle sitting and conversing on a on a rainy morning in the mountains having a chat you know that's that's the miracle this is the miracle really and I, any awakening that doesn't bring us to this any path that doesn't bring us to this moment now just as it is without needing anything more from it or of it i i don't want a path that doesn't do that that's what integration means as i understand it is now now is enough you know it's 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 an infinite gift now that that's integration from my perspective mm. it's beautiful it's beautiful yeah and i remember um uh, mezumi roshi a japanese master and uh, active in america in the later 20th century one of his books is called, I think I'm right, and I hope I'm right, something like Appreciate Your Life. Appreciate Your Life. Because you could maybe we just say appreciate now. Appreciate now. That's integration, I, I think. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I got, I've, I've, I've gone off the deep end. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. wonderful. Henry Shukman, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. We've yeah. hit record for an addendum. Yeah. MB. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shall I dive in? Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. It's just that reflecting on, you know, the, the conversation we're having about trauma and awakening and or enlightenment i just have this sense more and more these days that somehow you know suffering is really the key you know if we look at the four noble truths of buddhism of course you know the first one there is suffering and the se second one suffering has a cause and that cause is craving and the third one is that craving can cease there can be cessation and you know that can be interpreted i think in different ways but it can include this real sort of a momentary loss of everything everything gone everything set ceased no 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 mental experience no physical experience just gone gone not even consciousness actually i believe is possible and and then then somehow things come back but we're we're freed we're, it's changed but you know in any moment the suffering if suffering arises for ourselves for others it's the instant point of entry you know it's it's the it's somehow it's the embrace of suffering i mean suffering is the is the key it's without suffering no awakening the suffering it's just this switch in attitude to suffering that opens up enlightenment it's like a i'm, I'm rambling a bit but it's sort of like a a beautiful mm, chinese puzzle it interlocks you know the suffering the awakening the healing the trauma the healing the enlightenment they're all interconnected. Uh, I could probably be, I have, I think, maybe somewhere been a little bit more articulate on this. Maybe it's in the manuscript of the new book I'm working on. But it seems to me that in, in enlightenment, 
we're made to be so grateful for suffering. It, it, uh, we recognize one feature, I think, of, of awakening. I'm using it a little freely, actually, this terminology is maybe some will recognize that, you know, enlightenment, awakening. Somehow, uh, let's please for the moment accept them as interchangeable. I know that's not quite right in some traditions, but, but that, you know, one feature of it seems always to be afterwards, we're so grateful for our suffering. Without our suffering, we would not have pursued the path. And without our suffering, we couldn't have awakened into this life the way we just have, into the midst of things, as one Zen nun put it. She said, I've, I released my grip. The grip in my hand opened, released, and I fell into the midst of things. That's such a beautiful way of putting it. And, you know, that's... Whatever the actual um, phenomenology or kind of um, uh, experience in awakening, it seems to dump us <laughs> into here and now in a way that we had never been here and now before. We may have had, uh, what's the word, foreshadowings of it, but it's a whole new way of existing it's that it's almost what it is really it almost feels does feel appropriate to talk about i've been born for the first time you know that that kind of level of presence and intimacy and i don't know living in a in a different way than i knew was possible certainly as i've, I've experienced that that much i can say and and it immediately was clear to me that suffering was really the most blessed gift because without it this couldn't have happened and so i don't fully understand it by any means but i think there's some pr deep relationship you know between suffering trauma difficulty and awakening liberation, realization, release, this uh, the heart opening to boundless love or something like that, you know. There, um, so then, uh, then suffering is, is, turns into such a gift. The wound becomes um, the, the way. And yeah. I, it's lovely to, maybe that's what we mean by the res resolution of trauma, is that we we become so grateful for it. Instead of it being any kind of enemy or something to um, expunge, you know, it, it, it becomes um, our gateway, our... our um, our invitation, our, our trail of breadcrumbs leading to something so precious, you know, which, which is this life, this, this moment. It's such an incredible thing to, to be a human being, human mind of consciousness, human body, human heart. It's, it's, ah, oh. well, I, I, you know, words are inadequate, of course, but, you know, somehow to uh, inhabit, occupy this experience, this moment. And if the path to doing that more fully somehow must be through the doorway of suffering, it will make us so grateful to that suffering. So, okay. I don't think I'll include this, but maybe I'll tell you, I'll tell you uh, for your own amusement on the topic of suffering and the gateway of suffering. During that, after the near death, in the immediate aftermath of the near death uh, experience that I discussed with you off air before, when we're talking about similarities uh, in our narratives, um, I was in a lot of uh, sort of saturation level discomfort in the intensive care ward if we put it that way, near, near saturation level discomfort. And um, 
I uh, something interesting occurred if I thought about the past and prior to being so uncomfortable it was it seemed anyway unbearable if I thought about the future and the uncertainty of the future and the implications of this continuing and at that point there was a great deal of ambiguity about what was happening to me so there were no answers in that in the future nothing to hold on to um, that was also unbearable so in a certain sense the intensity of the discomfort squeezed uh, me by necessity into uh, out of you could say uh, projecting into the past and future and uh, at that point there was a kind of collapsing of uh, me if you like the perspective of me with the sensations of the discomfort and the sensations of discomfort in a certain sense to, uh, became just like an oscilloscope the you know the um, uh, imagery of that but a sort of um, yes. trans sense oscilloscope all senses no senses something like that a kind of just a and it was its flavor was uh everything and nothing at the same time so it lost its sense of uh suffering in the sense uh of being a personal problem for me and had this sort of sense of everything and nothing at the same time and then there was a mantra that emerged spontaneously which was now i'm okay now i'm okay now i'm okay which wasn't a consoling mantra sort of what you might imagine saying there there that sort of thing mm -hmm. it was more of a statement of right now um it was fine <laughs> i couldn't suffer a moment uh, if it was to continue for three or four seconds unbearable uh let alone minutes but at that exact precise moment, there was actually no problem at all. All of the problem was it was in the uh, was in the projection into the past and the future in a certain sense, and in in that way, that that went on for some hours, and so it was a scouring in a certain sense of the inside, uh, wow. a, a sort of imprinting of that uh, flavor, and it's very interesting because uh, a lot of the suffering I notice for myself uh, comes from. Um, uh, attempt to uh, basically uh, when suffering is felt all the way through one of the reasons it can be a gift is it can take you it can kill you right then in that moment it can take you to the thing that you're trying to fundamentally avoid which is extinction and it sh can short circuit the process that you're fundamentally attempting to del deludedly if you like continue which is continuity uh, uh, selfness you might say you know whatever this sort of yes. this, this uh, aspect of it it seems that the Craving and, delu and craving and aversion comes from ignorance of what? Emptiness, you could say, yes, or yes, yes. of tra transience. Yes, uh, yes. The, the realization of those is an immediate, uh, it spells death, <laughs> death, <laughs> which polarizes yeah. then life. And then the two of them join uh, together or have some sort of intimate relationship where both are, are, uh, both are there. And there's sort of this beautiful freedom that can come as a consequence of that squeeze. I think that's one of the ways in which myself I've noticed through no virtue of my own, just through, uh, you know, saturation level of discomfort, if we put it that way. Um, that's where it drove me. Look, that's fantastic to hear. Um, I, I'm so, uh, I'm really uh, in awe of how clearly you express it there. Perfectly put. Um, I could um, echo a little bit when, when, when the raging of my eczema when I was a kid, many nights um, in pain and it's, it's intense, intense itching alone at night, I would get pushed into a state of, that I now recognize actually was a Jana state. Huh. It's, it's, it's a different thing, not as, not as profound as what you're talking about, but uh, I can totally recognize uh, from various points including the eczema as a kid, but actually also on retreat, intense, intense pain leading to no self, you know, through entry into the pain. And then the pain becoming, you put it so well on a oscilloscope. I know exactly what you mean, that it's, it's kind of a, it's empty of valency, but there it is doing its thing. And it just doesn't matter. It's not a problem anymore. And, and the, your, your, that arise, spontaneously arising mantra, that's wonderful. I mean, Steve, I really hope you'll include that because that was fantastic. And it's so pertinent to what we've been discussing.
Well, perhaps it'll survive the edit. If it does, I might include your encouragement to have it survive the edit. Yes. Uh, as a cover for myself. Yes. Uh, so it doesn't look entirely like some ego trip on my part. No, exactly. Please, please, please. Because people I'm... are getting infuriated. <laughs> uh, not by me, because I don't do it, but, I, but I've, I've noticed that people get infuriated when you have Henry Schuchman on, or whoever it might be, and the interviewer decides, oh, yes, that reminds me of this time. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I almost gonna... died. Let me tell you this very long story about. I, I, I know you're you're a very sort of modest guy, and and I think it's very <laughs> admirable how you you know you make space for for these your guests to to talk away. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.